Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Kristen Talbot and I am the program coordinator for the MAVEN project. Thank you all for joining us today and for our friends at El Rio for hosting today's session on epilepsy on the front line, what pediatricians and primary care providers need to know about epilepsy with Dr. Selman. Dr. Jay Selman is a professor of clinical pediatric neurology at Columbia University Medical Center in New York. During his career, he has had an active private practice in adult and pediatric neurology in the suburban community and in the Manhattan practice. He has been chief of neurology at Blythedale Children's Hospital, a specialty rehabilitation hospital outside of New York for more than 10 years. He has also practiced in underserved areas of the Bronx and Manhattan as a pediatric neurologist. He recently joined Columbia Doctors in one of the Manhattan offices. Dr. Selman has participated in clinical research on children with traumatic brain injury and with anti-NMDA receptors. Uh, he has also participated in medical missions to the Dominican Republic where he lectured in Spanish and he is one of our valued uh, Maven Project volunteers. So Dr. Selman, when you are ready, please begin. Thank you so much, Kristen. I'm really sorry that I'm not able to see all of you who have joined from the far west and from the New York area. It's a pleasure to speak with you. Our cover slide is of the upper, upper west side in Columbia and the George Washington Bridge and the Hudson River. So um, not, as, not as wide open as, as Arizona. So uh, as Kristen said, this is the title of the presentation. I am going to skip lightly through uh, the disclosures and all the other things that we have to put in these. Um, I will try to be mindful of this situation and avoid this uh, disease so we don't have to call poison control, um, but I thought it's always apropos. So uh, our, our goals are to uh, uh, identify and manage status epilepticus to understand that to recognize presentations of different seizure types, to know four anti-seizure medications, and to understand uh, imaging, what to order and when, as well as when to refer. Uh, sorry about the technical glitch there at the uh, presentation. So another way of looking at this is what do we not want to miss? And uh, that's, always what we have to think about even in the office or in the emergency room. So we don't want to miss status epilepticus. We don't want to miss infantile spasms. And for each of uh, for the infantile spasms, I am going to show you actual examples. Um, absent seizures, juvenile myoclonic epilepsy, with which you may not be quite so familiar, but um, often undiagnosed or misdiagnosed for up to several years uh, before patients get treated. So let's turn our attention to the first topic, which is status epilepticus. So <clears throat> I don't know what your situations are in terms of how far you are from emergency rooms. <coughs> so um, this would obviously have to be adapted to your particular situations. But to turn first to definitions. So status epilepticus is a seizure which lasts 30 or more minutes or serial seizures. That means small individual seizures without recovery of consciousness between the actual individual seizures. This is a neurologic emergency and every facility needs a management guide. If you have 911 and a tertiary care facility close by, it needs to be less complex, but this is the, the outline of that. Um, and when we talk about the etiology of status epilepticus, uh, there are the, the three basic causes are failure to take anti-seizure medications. And the second is the failure to take anti-seizure medications. And the third is the failure to take anti-seizure medications. So you get the idea. Uh, I'll make one comment. We used to call these anti-epileptic drugs, but that was really a misnomer because we're not really treating the epilepsy per se. We're actually treating convulsions or seizures. Hence this more modern name of anti-seizure medicines or ASMs. Um, 
when we're thinking about the etiology of status, we also have to think about other causes, which include infections or para-infectious processes, trauma, neoplasm, metabolic or genetic etiology. These are obviously much rarer. Um, and every place needs to have a protocol. Just as we talk about with stroke, time is brain. The longer that someone is in status epilepticus, the greater the chance of permanent brain damage or even death. So recognizing it, being very systematic about evaluating and treating and recording what we do, starting anti-seizure medications promptly, and planning two or three steps ahead in terms of transport to the close, closest emergency department or tertiary care. So um, uh, the, when we think about having a, a protocol, the first thing uh, we think about are personnel and the, the motto is divide and conquer, meaning there are different kinds of tasks that require different personnel. So the team leader is an MD, just like running a, a cardiorespiratory uh, code and the MD is going to do direct patient assessment, run the protocol. You need another MD or an MP who can get a very detailed history from the parents about what happened, what was going on, does the patient take medication, who's the doctor, et cetera. Another, um, an RN or an MA or, or a second MP should be charting exact times and interventions. So the, the status of epileptic code is called, someone starts recording the time, each of the interventions, response, and, uh, and that way there's an accurate record. You need an RN2 to uh, administer medications with answer back, meaning uh, the doctor says diazepam 10 milligrams IV, and the nurse says 10 milligrams diazepam administered. You need a respiratory tech who can manage airway, ensure that there's adequate oxygenation if needed. In some cases, you need an anesthesiologist to manage more complex airway. The lab should be geared up to be able to run stat, uh, uh, stat labs, especially glucose and electrolytes, <clears throat> and maybe even some of the common anti-seizure medications. There, you need to have a protocol for an emergency CT if that's available where you're working. If you're outpatient, that's usually not available. And there needs to be uh, easily accessible communication with the tertiary care center, uh, an understanding of transfer procedures, and someone needs to be updating the family in terms of where things are, how the patient is responding, what the next steps are if uh, transport is imminent. Um, practicing having the protocol and practicing it are essential. So uh, the uh, so we want to get a rapid history, documentation of everything. And another aspect of this is someone should, let's say this happens at school, then make every effort to contact the teacher or the school nurse, whomever witnessed the seizure. That's really important because uh, information gets lost and distorted, um, you know, like the game of telephone. So if you can speak to someone who is a primary witness, you know, tell me instant replay what happened from beginning to end till they transported to the clinic or whatever, uh, that's helpful. Um, the rapid examination, uh, vital signs, airway, cardiopulmonary, neurologic trauma screen, Remember the A, B, C, D, the airway, breathing, circulatory with cardiac and dextrose or blood sugar. Um, pick a, a first line drug with which you're comfortable, the pharmacy is gonna support you. Um, Bedazolam is one of them. Um, diazepam is another. Uh, some places use lorazepam, it doesn't matter. They're all very effective. And in head-to-head -head studies, they're, they're very equivalent. So for midazolam, you can give it IM. 
Uh, you can also give it IV, intranasal, uh, buccal. So if access is a problem, this is a great way to go. Diazepam has been around a long time. This is not available in rectal form. I'm sorry, in, in um, oral or, um, <coughs> uh, um, I'm sorry, you can, uh, the diazepam is available as diastat, uh, where you can use it rectally. The absorption time is very rapid, not quite as fast as intravenous, uh, but where you don't have IV access, this is a great way to go. And the dosing is basically 0 0.3 milligrams per kilogram up to about 20 milligrams. Um, for IV, use the number 0 0.2 milligrams. Um, the worst mistake is underdosing. And that's often a problem which can lead to prolongation of the status epilepticus. So don't get caught up in this. This is one um, proposed um, algorithm or plan, <clears throat> but I'm going to break it down and this will be available in the slide deck and so you could print it out. So don't, don't get crazy. So, so from zero to five minutes is what some call the stabilization phase. So you want to make sure the patient is stable with respect to the ABCDs. You're gathering the history uh, making sure the patient is oxygenated, starting ECG monitoring, doing the, the point of POS glucose, and uh, getting the IV access. Um, uh, <clears throat> if you're dealing with adults, then you want to give uh, thiamine 100 milligrams IV um, and, and uh, 50 millimeters of D50W. We don't use that in kids. So we use D25. So that basically the stabilization, making sure the patient has stable vital signs, you're getting access and you're starting to collect the history. In the second phase, which is initial therapy, uh, the goal is that within uh, 10 minutes or so, um, you wanna give the, the first anti-seizure medicine. And the most effective is the benzodiazepine. Uh, here are some of the choices. Uh, I'm not going to go through all of these one by one, but just suffice it to say the midazolam or lorazepam or diazepam or diastat. <clears throat> and there's some alternatives. Uh, phenobarbital, we tend not to use so often as first line drug. It can cause significant respiratory depression, especially if it is combined with, uh, with one of the uh, benzodiazepines. So uh, if the seizure continues, you need to move to the next step. Uh, if it is, the seizure stops, you cannot stop there because the benzodiazepines are only gonna work for somewhere between 15 minutes and an hour, maybe an hour and a half, two hours. So you need to get another medication on board. Uh, if the seizures are not continuing, you need to call 911 or the emergency transfer. It's not an elective transfer. It is a neurologic emergency and you need a high level stat transfer. Um, so, um, if the seizures are continuing and you have access, uh, uh, you can start with one of the drugs listed here. I would say in most places, they're using Keppra or Levetiracetam. 60 milligrams per kilogram is the initial dose. <clears throat> uh, I think the reason is it's generally effective and the ease of use. Um, with intravenous phosphentoin, you've got to be careful that there's no extravasation. You have to give it uh, at a slower rate. Um, and these are basically equivalent, roughly equivalent. There are some studies that show that the IV valproate is uh, more effective. Most places don't have that easily available. So if you're in a community center or primary care facility, I would not expect that you would have the valproate. Um, and you might not even have the IV K 
Kefra, but it has a good shelf life and that's probably the most practical one to keep. Um, some places will use uh, phenobarbital, um, but uh, e even in the, in the big hospitals, you, you don't run to that uh, immediately. Um, so as I said, the intravenous levetiracetam or Kefra is usually the way to go. Um, there are no clear guidelines and, and most likely, unless you're way out in the country uh, or there's a snowstorm and you can't get the patient <clears throat> to a tertiary care, this is not gonna be applicable, but I'm including it for the sake of completeness. So um, now I'd like to turn to classification of seizures. So there is a group called the ILAE, the International League Against Epilepsy. It has been around a long, long time, and they play a big role in terms of educating physicians, <coughs> excuse me, other medical personnel, and, and the general public, and supporting families. So um, uh, call your attention uh, first to um, the seizure types. And uh, we're gonna go over this again, but focal, generalized, or unknown, unclassified. And from that, that helps us with the clinical history to discuss the epilepsy types. We're not gonna spend any big amount of time that, on that here. And then there are some uh, comorbidities which may go along with epilepsies. These could include things like metabolic disorders, developmental issues. Uh, we need to be mindful of those. And then we look at the etiology, um, uh, things like structural lesions, genetic, infectious, metabolic, immune, or unknown. <clears throat> so this is the way we this is the way we approach things and Hold on one second. Um, and so the basic seizure types are focal, where the, where the seizure starts from a discrete place in the brain. Most common areas are frontal and temporal and the deeper structures such as the hippocampus or amygdala. This focal is in contrast to the generalized where the seizure is basically starting in the whole brain at the same time. And then there are types that are just difficult to classify or we don't have enough information. But for your purpose, thinking of trying to understand if the process is a focal one or a generalized is the way to start. So for focal epilepsy, as I said, there is onset from a specific site or focus. It may remain localized in that one area or there can be a secondary spread to other areas. <clears throat> so we break down the classification of focal seizures to state whether or not there's impairment of awareness. So we used to call this consciousness, um, but uh, awareness is a broader term because um, someone, it can be difficult to, um, you define the consciousness, even awareness is sometimes difficult. So the focal seizures can be um, uh, motor uh, or sensory, uh, special sensory, so that could be olfactory, gustatory, auditory, visual, or cognitive, or some combination. So and it can start as one of these and become uh, with secondary spread. When we think about etiologies, we think about structural lesions. So those would be congenital malformations, such as an arteriovenous malformation, an aneurysm, or dysplasia, which is an abnormal formation of the cortex of the brain. It, it can be very localized or it can be a more generalized process. These often have a genetic um, uh, etiology. Certainly trauma um, is uh, another cause. Genetic etiology, so things like tuberous sclerosis, neurofibromatosis. Vascular lesions can operate in different ways. So first is 
as a vascular problem. The second is they can have mass effect. <clears throat> so with AVMs, arteriovenous malformations, the brain tissue within the AVM is often hypoxic because there's a steel phenomena, the capillaries are not there, and the um, uh, area of the brain within the AVM may be, become abnormal and can become a seizure focus. Aneurysms are abnormal dilatations of arterial structures. Again, there can be leaks, there can be mass effect. There are also developmental venous malformations. So these used to be called angiomas and they can occur anywhere in the brain. And that can be a focus of a seizure. And obviously stroke is, is something we have to be concerned about. So infectious and parainfectious processes that occur in the congenital, as congenital infections, um, and then acquired infections, which would include things like meningitis, encephalitis, ADEM, acute demyelinating encephalomyelitis, abscesses, which function both from a point of, uh, have an impact both in terms of an irritative focus, as well as a mass effect, and the same for empyemas. So these are infectious etiologies. And, and this would also include the autoimmune phenomenon, um, especially in kids, anti-NMDA receptor encephalitis is by far the most common etiology. GAD65 is also seen, but much, much less commonly. So when we think about the generalized epilepsies, we can classify them as being major motor. And within that group, you can have the tonic seizures. We're gonna see some of that, but that's basically an extension of the upper and lower extremities, often with arching of the back. The clonic seizures, which are a jerk and a relaxation, jerk and relaxation, <coughs> or, <coughs> excuse me, combinations of both of these. Uh, so it can be tonic-clonic, it can be clonic-tonic-clonic, uh, a lot of different variations, but they're all part of the generalized. We then talk about absent seizures. So the, here, there is not a big motor component. There can be some minor components such as eye blinking or, uh, eye, or some facial movement, but they're, they're really at a minimum. Infantile spasms, and we're gonna spend a lot of time talking about that um, because it's very important to recognize it. And it could be mommy bringing in a six month old and saying that he's got colic. And then myoclonic, which are jerk seizures, uh, and some of these result in falls or serious accidents. And then the juvenile myoclonic, which is a very specific type of seizure that I, as I mentioned before, is often unrecognized. So that's, that's what we're going to try and cover. So in the generalized EEG, uh, epilepsies, there is no focality in the EEG or in the clinical presentation. As I said, there's involvement of the brain at the onset. And very often there's a genetic and or familial pattern. Let's talk about the clinical presentations of seizures. And um, I have uh, several videos, which I hope will work because I think that really gives you a much better feel. And so before we do that, I just wanna highlight some of the risk factors for epilepsy. So if we, look at that from a chronological point of view, uh, prematurity per se, perinatal distress, hypoxic ischemic injuries are big factors. There can be genetic or family history, traumatic brain injury, complex medical disorders such as malignancies, inflammatory processes, uh, disorders of coagulation, autoimmune, genetic, uh, CNS infections, we mentioned uh, the different types, meningitis, encephalitis, uh, abscesses, empyemas, and then the vascular components. So if we look at the epilepsies by age, we're going to look at the neonatal period, 
which you may or may not see. Um, if you're not in the hospital, you're probably not gonna see this, but you could see them within the first 30 days after a child has gone home, the childhood epilepsies and those that present in adolescence. So for, for the perinatal or neonatal period, um, by far and away hypoxic ischemic events, prematurity, coexisting sepsis, meningitis, encephalitis, um, uh, especially um, uh, herpes encephalitis uh, can be very devastating. Metabolic genetic disorders, especially amino acidurias may present at that time. And a very, very important one is neonatal stroke, which very often presents with focal seizures, not in a hemiparesis as you would see in an older child, teen or adult. So the focals, if you see a focal seizure in the neonatal brain, think stroke. And this is more likely to happen in preterms, but it can also happen in full-term infants. So if we move from the neonatal period to early infancy, then um, what we come, up, come to uh, most importantly are infantile spasms uh, because, and I'm putting them first, because they do occur frequently on a relative basis and because they are so devastating. Uh, there can be other focal or generalized seizures, uh, those that occur with infectious or parent infectious <coughs> excuse me, processes, trauma, and metabolic and genetic. So, um, hold on one second here. So, infantile spasms. Onset is between three and 12 months. Uh, there are rare cases of starting earlier. The mass, vast majority are gonna present between about four and eight months. What's really critical about these is that they resemble minor behaviors that would normally not concern us. So a child nodding, a little unusual startle, colic-like behaviors, and that's how Parents may present, uh, you know, may call it, you know, little Billy's doing something. I, you know, it looks like he's got colic, but I'm not sure. Please take a look. This is a neurologic emergency. <clears throat> the more rapid the treatment, the better the outcome. And so it's really important to keep this in your mind. The diagnosis starts with suspicion. We need a prompt EEG. MRI, gen genetic metabolic evaluations, but, but being on the front lines in a clinic, an emergency room, in a doctor's office, the, uh, the, or perhaps potentially even a daycare center, um, the first thing is to suspect it when you see these funny mo uh, moves. Um, very often, these seizures will gradually stop in the between 12 and 24 months, but they often evolve into other types of seizures, which are typically very difficult to control. And there is a high rate of serious developmental delay. All right, here we go. This is first video. Um, so watch very carefully, look at the child, and I'm gonna stop it or try to stop it periodically. Did you see that? I'm gonna play that again. I don't, I can't get feedback from you, but, but. That was one, that's another one. So what did you see? You saw in that one extension, the arms went up, the legs went up. Uh, there was a little bit of head movement. Uh, the most common presentation are flexion. So the arms coming down, the Germans call this Blitzkrampf, which is like a lightning cramp. Um, and you see the child doubling over uh, with or without any noise, with or without eye movements. These can occur hundreds of times per day. So here's another one. See that? 
do that again. So the baby's there. Oh, that was a that was flexion. The knees then and hips, lower extremities flexed up, shoulders hunched, flexed over, and there was a little head movement, maybe a little eye movement. So, oh, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to go back there. So that, that's more of an extension of the upper extremities, probably some flexion of the lower extremities. So these are not dramatic. This is not what you read or see in, in people that are having grand mal seizures, major motor seizures. <coughs> um, we're gonna continue. Did you see that? That was just, is he falling asleep? Um, that, that is how they can look, so subtle. Um, See that? Okay, so these are an emergency. Uh, let me see if there's another one. Oh, here's another one. There, there the child that's flexion. <coughs> As it notes here, colic, reflux, startle. This is for families. I think that's about it for this one. I don't think they're uh, As this says, these can occur in isolation or they can have flurries of them. Uh, families should take a video because they might not do it when you go to see the doctor. <coughs> um, I, don't th I don't think there are any more here. Um, all right, can I get out of here? Okay, um, so uh, all right, I hope that was helpful. So uh, I'm I'm not going to make you electroencephalographers, but I want to show you what this looks like when we do the EEG. Uh, turn your attention on the right side in in the blue frame. Uh, this is an EEG. Uh, these are going from front to back for each four on the left and the right. And if you can imagine here, I'm sorry, it's not bigger. Uh, maybe it is on your screen. There's rhythmical regular activity. There's one second between each of the heavy lines. And uh, there should be a difference between the back of the brain and the front. Um, looks pretty calm. <clears throat> now cast your attention to the left and you see these high amplitude as opposed to these over here, discharges and uh, with this arrow, uh, the top arrow, very high amplitude. Um, and then there are periods where the brain activity really flattens out and you don't have the regular activity that you see here. And this is really an exaggerated, before it is this run of, rapid uh, spikes and then high amplitude slow waves and then this flattening where the brain just uh, shuts down, it's, it quietens out. And that's why we call this hips, arrhythm oh, misspelling, sorry about that. Um, uh, hips arrhythmia, meaning mountainous waves. And that's exactly what that looks like. So this is not to make you ele electroencephalographers, but Here's another one because I want this, these images to be seared into your mind. I uh, see that. Okay, that was one. This is a doctor talking in the background. Another one with the face, the arms extending. <laughs> another one. This is not quite a flurry. In a flurry, they can come even closer together. This is this is starting to be a flurry. Okay. 
but you know the parents might bring the, the child in and he's not doing anything that's why if they can take a video it is so valuable i'm just recording in case you missed it Oh, yeah, okay. See, I don't know if that's the nurse or the mother didn't really appreciate oh, it, but yeah. this know, child is having ongoing that. episodes. Um, All right. So, um, as we said, in terms of treatment, time is brain. Our first treatment is corticosteroids. There has been an ongoing controversy for 40 years. Uh, between prednisone and ACTH. ACTH used to be very reasonably priced. Um, now it's uh, unbelievably expensive. They're, they're proponents of both of them. Uh, there may be a slight advantage to the ACTH, but you know that's gonna be done in the hospital. One of the newer medicines uh, called bigabitrin or Sabril has a particular place if the patient has tuberous sclerosis complex. Uh, sometimes we need to use valproate or clobazam, which is another uh, uh, benzodiazepine. So what happens after infantile spasms? Well, as I mentioned, these usually resolve by 12 to 18 months. <clears throat> And uh, they're often followed by intractable epilepsies of mixed types. And it is usually associated with significantly impaired development. Okay. So we're going to move from Dr. the Dr. Selman? Yes. Okay. We had a question that I think is a little timely. So I just wanted to ask this. It says, how do you tell sure. these infantile, sorry, how do you tell these infantile spasms from startle? Uh, that's a great question. So some of the things are, uh, one of the first thing is if you see a flurry of these, if you're seeing them like we did in some of these videos, uh, this last one, uh, where you see it periodically, uh, that, uh, would, that would push you in the direction of infantile spasm. <laughs> um, when they start, usually within days to a week, there are going to be too many to count. And kids just don't have the startles. Also, startles often occur in the context of some sort of external stimulation. So it could be, you know, putting a cold washcloth on the child or uh, the smoke detector going off or the dog barking. Uh, so that would push you in the other direction. Um, it's just, it's the very stereotypical nature and seeing them in flurries. That it's a very good question. I'm hoping having seen this, you, you would say that if you had a chance to see some of these that you would not say that's a startle. I would also add, if you really are not certain, you must get an EEG. And unless you get the EEG, you know, on the first day or so, it's, uh, if you get a longer study, it's almost invariably gonna be abnormal. <clears throat> I can't say nothing's 100%, but almost invariably. So um, thank you for the question. It's a great question. So looks, let's look at epilepsy in childhood. So we have febrile convulsions. We have primary generalized absence, seizures formerly known as petit mal, and a very, very common form of seizure called benign epilepsy with centrotemporal spikes. This disorder has 14 or 15 different names. It's also been called Rolandic seizures or epilepsy. Some people call it the Disney World. Um, epilepsy because parents are driving with their kids in the car all night or they're all the whole family staying in the room and they notice that the kid has a seizure maybe sleep deprived and and that's when they find it i had a colleague who worked in orlando he saw he saw these daily almost it, uh, so common <coughs> Uh, then there's the generalized major motor that used to be called ton, uh, uh, grand mal. 
Um, there are post-traumatic seizures, um, peri-infectious and metabolic. So just a quick review of the febrile seizures. Simple febrile seizures usually start between six months, could be four and a half, five months. Almost are always gone by five years. Usually the onset is before two years of age. These are brief, lasting one to two minutes in the vast majority of cases, but they can last up to 15. Generally, there's no recurrence within 24 hours. The children are developing normally. If you look at very large studies, there is a somewhat increased risk of epilepsy, but it's really slight. These tend to run in family histories, and usually uh, there is no intracranial pathology or infection. Um, there is the potential for a genetic uh, etiology <coughs> with specific syndromes, but again, these are really rare. So those are simple febrile seizures. The complex febrile seizures occur around the same time. They can be focal, they're often prolonged, and they tend to recur. So if you have a child that has two of them in 24 hours, that qualifies as a complex uh, febrile seizure, and there is a higher risk for having epilepsy or recurrent seizures. Um, I want to talk about childhood absence epilepsy. Onset is typically three to 10 years of age. Most of these kids are developing normally, and someone comes in saying, Johnny or Mary is staring. Very often, it'll be a teacher saying, you know, Johnny's just not paying attention. He just, he just zoned out, staring off into space. Um, or, um, you know, he was walking, he just stopped in the, you know, in the middle of the hall and just stood there. And, and then he started walking again. Our parents will say, you know, he was eating and, you know, taking the fork and going and stopping, maybe blinking a little. So on your right, is um, an EEG and the red line uh, indicates one second. And you see these things that look like if you put your finger on it would prick you and that's a spike and then a slow wave. And there are about two and a half to three and a half of these per second. <clears throat> As you see, they're generalized. They start boom all at once across the entire brain. And when they're over, they stop, boom. If the episode lasts more than about two seconds, the person is not going to respond. So in the office, we try to trigger these by hyperventilation. And when I do, when we do that, I will give the child something to remember. So like ABC or New York Yankees or 175 and to make sure that they're able to respond and you'll have a feel for the latency. They'll respond within, within a second or so. But if I do that in this point or onward, if I said one, two, three right here, the child might say over here, one, two, three, more than likely just gonna ignore me. So that helps to confirm a clinical seizure. Uh, intermittent photic stimulation with a party or strobe light can have the same effect. <clears throat> um, so as I said, the features of childhood absence seizures are staring spells, rhythmic blinking of the eyes or the face at about three per second. They're usually brief, less than 10 seconds, but they can last up to 30 seconds. As I said, abrupt onset and offset uh, and they're often amnestic if longer. Our drug of choice is ethosuximide or Zorontin. Um, Lamictal is probably the second, and then Valproate. Uh, I want to show you this because it's worth a thousand words. The watcher, that right there. So she was having some semi rhythmic blinking and then staring. <clears throat> Let's just do that again. Oh, there, there, there. She's sort of blinking, staring, looking up. 
okay? And then they can be really subtle. Here's another one. What's this sound? What's this? What is this, first of all? The, what is oh, that sound? What is that sound? That's a guitar. Can you say guitar? Good job. Right. Okay. And what is? Oh, there's one. So she had a little bit of a myoclonic jerk with that. She may have had some very brief ones before. Good. Like, like, good. Like, grandma. Like, dad. Good. Like, good golly. Huh? No. Okay. She stopped and paused here. She froze. There's one. So there's a little bit of neck extension, a myoclonic jerk. So there's there are different varieties. Okay. And here's another one. <laughs> so here's a child who's hyperventilating and and he just stops hyperventilating. It's a little mouth movements and he stops again. He didn't hear what the what the doctor was saying so from the generalized i want to move to the focal or partial epilepsies again these arise from specific parts of the brain and they can remain localized or they can become secondarily generalized uh, there can be um, uh, impairment of consciousness so we talk about absent impairment and these would be simple focal or partial seizures. But if there's a change in behavior, alertness, uh, ability to respond, then we would say there's impairment of awareness or impairment of consciousness. These can occur at any age. So one specific type of focal epilepsy is the benign epilepsy with central temporal spikes or Rolandic. These tend to start between three and 13 years of age often nocturnal, and really involves the face, eyes, and mouth. So if you look on the homunculus, you remember that from when we were in medical school a few years ago? Well, that's this yellow part that's highlighted here. This part of the brain is where these um, arise. So they tend to involve the eyes, the face, and mouth, much less common the arm, and even less common the legs. Interestingly, when they have these, the children often make uh, weird guttural oral pharyngeal noises. There's often hypersalivation and very characteristic, but not 100%. Memory is retained. So they will not be able to talk to you during the seizure, but as soon as it's over, she said, Yes, mommy went and called Dr. Brown and told her that I was doing something funny and what should I do? So they, they often have this. There is an increased association with learning disabilities, especially reading disorders and with migraine. The good news about this is that they almost always resolve by early adolescence and they don't come back. <clears throat> they often are familial. And if you need to treat them, meaning they occur frequently or longer, the parents are upset, they respond exquisitely to different medications. So this is one that you're likely to see. This is a sample. It's very hard to find a, a video of this. So uh, this is a child that obviously at night. Um, here we go. So I face somebody, body movements. And you hear a little bit of noise. So those kind of guttural noises. And uh, this is an example of a focal motor seizure. This is not the Rolandic. This is a different one, but I wanted to show you an example. Head turning to the right, staring, mouth movements. probably would not have responded, but they didn't test that. Just to show you again, 
So head turning to the right, eyes to the right, lip smacking, there could be salivation, there could be change in tone, but that's what these look like. Uh, this is another one. I don't think this is real. I think this is somebody acting, but <clears throat> you know, in an older child or an adult, it might look like this. My first quarter for a second. Arrest. So some purposeless movements, turning of the head, facial movement, loss of awareness. I cannot vouch whether this is real or acting. So when we get to adolescence, <clears throat> you can see the same kind of generalized seizures, which may or may not have a genetic etiology, um, post-traumatic seizures, the autoimmune, and I want to focus on the juvenile myoclonic, because you will see these if you're <clears throat> in the clinic long enough. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and they're very important to recognize. As I mentioned, the, the typical delay in diagnosis is anywhere from two to five years. And uh, there's very good treatment. Um, so these are the, the different generalized. Uh, here's an example of a generalized major motor seizure. Again, I think this is acting, but it does highlight some of the features. So stiffening, tonic phase, extension of the arms, some clonic movements, uh, a pretty good actress. And this is a generalized tonic seizure with the stiffening. Again, this may be an actress. <coughs> I think this is a, a, someone acting. She has a little smirk on her face. This looks too set up, but you could see that the lower extremities would probably be extended, back arched, but gives you a little bit of. So we're going to turn to the juvenile myoclonic epilepsy. These tend to begin in the preteen or teenage years. Very characteristic. Seizures occur on awakening, not 100%. And that could be awakening from sleep or uh, you know overnight or from a nap. They are aggravated or provoked by sleep deprivation. So the high school or college kid that pulls an all-nighter is at risk, alcohol, drugs. <clears throat> and for many of them, it's not a full seizure, but you can have jerking or twitching. And parents will sometimes say, well, you know, I can't let Billy or Mary pour the juice in the morning um, they can do it at lunch or dinner, but in the morning, it's likely to just splash all over everywhere. Um, these are often familial, and Keppra or Levetiracetam is a good choice, a good first drug. This is an example. Again, I think this is an actor. It, these are so hard to capture. <clears throat> um, get this over within its own time. Jacob, what are you doing? But that's that's what you know. They can look He's something like the that. Sheep. They don't have to be that dramatic. They can be more <laughs> more subtle. Um, and here's another one. I think this is this is somebody acting. It just is not as likely to be focused. More likely to be bilateral but I'm sharing what, what I could find. And here's another one. Nope, oh, hold on one second. Why is this not, okay. So that's an example. Um, because we're running a little short on time, I want to move, move ahead. I want to call your attention to one of the most difficult things that we have to deal with, and you're probably going to see it, but the onus on you is not to make the diagnosis, but to recognize that it exists and to reach out, you know, for help in managing that. And those are non-epileptogenic seizures or non-epileptogenic epilepsy. The very important thing to keep in mind is the third line. And these may occur with true epileptogenic seizures, which makes life extremely difficult for us. And to give you an idea how prevalent this is, 
about 25% of patients who are admitted for inpatient epilepsy monitoring turn out to have non-epileptogenic seizures. So if you think about it, these are people that have seen a regular doctor, seen a neurologist, maybe an epileptologist, not sure. And so it's very prevalent. Management is difficult, but the, the patient needs a full evaluation. The treatment needs to be comprehensive with not only neurology, but psychiatry, psychology, family medicine. This is an example <coughs> of such a case. <coughs> I don't know if this child also has it. So- Sean. Sean. So there's just some, you know, arching- Sean. Pelvic movements. Um, hey, bud. There's Sean. no other clonic You're movements. You're all right, baby. Um, and this is continuing. Um, the head is going in different directions. The eyes are open. Um, hey, Sean. And Sean. Um, remember, they can occur with hey, real, with real seizures. Um, here's another one which I could be acting. I don't know. Um, The head is moving awfully, awfully slowly, uh, and and it doesn't usually go back and forth. Okay, and then the jerking. You know, this is this is not convincing for a real seizure. Um, so, I hope people can stay. I'm running a little bit late, and um, I got that virus that I showed you, um, PowerPoint poisoning. I apologize. I hope you can stay. If you can't, then we are sharing the slide deck. So I think there are four anti-seizure medications that people in the real world taking care of patients on the front line need to know about. <coughs> there are many, many more that exist now, but these are going to take you a long way. Uh, the first is Keppra uh, or Levetiracetam oxcarbazepine or trileptal, ethosuximide, and then the um, diazepam. So uh, levetiracetam is a broad spectrum anti-seizure medicine, meaning it works on focal seizures, generalized status epilepticus. Uh, if you're not in stat status epilepticus, then the starting dose is here. The most significant adverse effect is some people get really, really cranky on it and irritable, uh, and that may limit the use. It doesn't get better with time. Sometimes vitamin B6, uh, pyridoxine at 25, 50, or 100 milligrams a day will help. Why that works, nobody knows. It was a serendipitous finding. Um, the... It comes in a variety of formulations. It comes in a in a, a liquid. It comes in pills, and it comes in long acting and the IV. You can usually give it twice a day. Remember that it does have a renal metabolism. There are some minimal drug drug interactions. Ethosuximide or Zorontin, its use is for primary generalized absence epilepsy. Period, and it's been around since before I went into training, which was a few years ago. It's generally fairly well tolerated. Some people, especially at the higher doses, may have GI upset or drowsiness, dizziness. It comes as a capsule, which you can't open, or it comes as an elixir. And the capsule's on the larger side, so you can't use that in the younger kids. Um, although it has a very long half-life, we usually give it uh, twice a day. And <clears throat> there can be drug interaction with phenytoin, which we don't use anymore, maybe with valproate. So turning to oxcarbazepine or trileptal, this is very useful in the focal or partial seizures. It may be helpful in many of the generalized seizures, but there's some of them that may be aggravated by, uh, by the oxcarbazepine. This is the starting dose. Um, so there are a couple of things to know about this. 
Uh, the first is uh, the side effects. So this is typical of the old anticonvulsants like phosphenatoin and phenobarbital. You've got to worry about GI, CNS, blood, uh, adverse effects, plus with this and its cousin, um, uh, carbamazepine or Tegretol, hyponatremia. Um, so uh, the other characteristic of this is uh, something called autoinduction, meaning that the drug itself induces rapid metabolism in the liver. So it can take a while, up to two to three to even four weeks to get to uh, a steady state dose. You just have to remember that. There are a fair number of drug interactions. Um, it does come in different formulations. It's a very useful, very useful drug. Uh, I did not put down Stevens-Johnson reaction, but you can get that with basically any of these drugs. I don't think it occurs with uh, Keppra. Um, and we're not talking about Lamotrigine, but rapid titration can cause uh, Stevens-Johnson. So we now come to diazepam, which is now available in different formulations. The, uh, the indications are for status epilepticus, for breakthrough seizures, and for cluster seizures, which is groupings of seizures. Um, the dosing is here. Uh, the, the, there's a sliding scale for the rectal use. Um, and um, the new kit on the block is, is Valtoco, uh, which is... Uh, the, which is a great drug. The problem is getting insurance companies to cover it. So it's highly variable across different insurance companies. Um, and, uh, and the picture shows you what it's like. You press the center thing. And depending on the weight, you give uh, one, uh, the, there's five milligram, 10, 50, uh, and seven and a half and 10. And you can use that to get to the different dosings. So it's really handy <coughs> uh, because the alternative is diastat, which we all know about. <coughs> it works, but, you know, wanting to give a 10 year old or a 15 year old rectal Valium in the hall, that's not what you want to do. Um, the side effects are all the same. Uh, with Valtoco, you can get nasal discomfort, congestion, but you're usually doing it once. Um, these are metabolism in the liver, but you're using one time basis. It's usually not a problem. Uh, while they have a long half life, the efficacy. Uh, is usually gone between 12 and 24 hours. So if you use this, you need a long acting medication, either an adjustment of an existing dose of medication or starting one. So if we talk about lab studies and anti-seizure medication, <clears throat> uh, I'm not gonna talk about status again, refer back to that. Why do we do it? So we wanna know if we have an effective blood level. We often wanna know is the patient compliant? And sometimes we need to know, is there evidence of toxicity? So in general, a good guideline is always obtain the, the blood level, the anti-seizure level before the morning dose. That's the most reliable and consistent time. And you can compare one time to the other. Some medications such as Valproid vary wildly from hour to hour. So those it's absolutely imperative to do before the morning dose. Um, there are other labs that may be needed. Um, <clears throat> typically for Keppra and the benzos, you don't need labs. Ethosuximide, sometimes you need to check LFTs. Um, as I mentioned for oxcarpazepine and carbamazepine, CBC, CMP, and uh, with the electrolytes. With Depakote and those compounds, uh, if there's any evidence of abdominal pain, you have to get, uh, think about an amylase lipase. If there's alteration of consciousness, um, sedation, have to think ammonia level, which you cannot do as an outpatient because 
it won't be valid. <clears throat> Lamotrigine, minimal monitoring, but CBC. Um, if you're using topiramate, zonisamide, following renal function, very rarely you have to think about getting ammonia level. So we're going, we're getting to the end here, everybody. Thanks for your patience. When do you refer to neurology? So obviously in status epilepticus, infantile spasms, prolonged seizures, uncontrolled seizures, side effects. And if you're not comfortable, then send them to us. That's why, that's why we're here. Anybody gives you a hard time, try to find somebody else. <clears throat> also think about neurology when there are suspicious episodes or unexplained loss of consciousness. If there's a change in function and if there's an associated significant family history. And I think it's important not to look at it as, as sending the patient to the neurologist and goodbye but hopefully developing a collaborative relationship. That's what we try to do. In terms of imaging, uh, unless you're in the emergency room, that's not really gonna be an issue, but we use a CT in the emergency room, especially if there's trauma because it's quick, it's fast, it's relatively inexpensive. Uh, <coughs> uh, if there's seizure with fever, not a simple febrile seizure, uh, we want an MRI with and without contrast to see if there's evidence of inflammation, abscess. Um, as I said, with trauma or injury, CT of the brain, focal or partial seizures, we're going to want an MRI with and without contrast. And if it's not standard, you want to say with epilepsy protocol. What does that give you? That they will do very thin sections. Uh, through the temporal lobes, the frontal lobes. And that's very important for picking up very subtle brain malformations uh, or small strokes, for example. In generalized seizures, unless there's an episode of hypoxia, we generally don't do uh, imaging. Uh, there, um, so we've been over this, um, uh, so we want to ask for an epilepsy protocol if you're doing that. Um, other aids, we've already alluded to this, but home videos are so important and so much easier than, than many years ago when I started. We have routine EEGs, which can vary from 40 minutes to a couple of hours. We have ambulatory EEGs in which we can record with or without video for up to 72 hours. And then uh, for patients that really can't cooperate or where we need very detailed observation, inpatient monitoring. I've already mentioned the imaging. Now treatment. Ideally, <coughs> except in the case of status, uh, if you're on the front line, the neurology consultation first makes sense. We want to look at the probability of seizure recurrence and think about basic principles. So if you are seeing a patient with a neurology, the importance of compliance, that means taking the medicine every day as directed. That means not running out of the medication. Um, we always like to see patients within two to four weeks of starting treatment because it's surprising how often they don't actually start or they have questions or they can't get the medicine. And we wanna look for adverse effects. So to summarize, we're here guys. Status epilepticus, recognize it, have a treatment plan, be familiar with it. We wanna recognize some of the important seizure phenotypes, infantile spasms because early treatment is so important absent seizures because they can be easily missed, the focal or generalized seizures, the juvenile myoclonic seizures because they're very subtle and can also be missed. <coughs> Take time to review the four basic anti-seizure medicines. We've been over the emergency imaging, the use of uh, medication uh, levels, and developing a referral network. So I did run a bit over. Thank you for your patience. And uh, I'm happy to entertain questions now, or you can make note of my email, 
feel free to send me emails. Just say, I heard you on Maven. And I try to answer everything the same day, if not the next day. And thank you again. Uh, thank you, Kristen, for hosting us. Of course. Thank you, Dr. Selman. We do have a few quick questions, so we'll get through them really quick. Sure. Um, I'm happy to stay. First is, is JME dangerous if not treated? <laughs> um, I mean, potentially, yes, because it's interfering with function and people can hurt themselves. I mean, they can have a seizure, fall down and get and get head injury. And if this happens, for example, in, in the early morning after awakening, the bathroom is the most dangerous room in the house, except maybe your workshop. But it's the most dangerous room. Everything is hard. There are angles. There's water if you're in the bathtub. Uh, so yes, it, it, they can be dangerous themselves or as a secondary effect. Okay. With trigger tall, up to date says check your analysis. Why? I'm sorry. I know I'm going to mess this one up. It's a medicine <laughs> with Tegretol. Oh, Tegretol. Yes. Up to date says check your analysis, your analysis. Why? That's a good question. Um, they're very smart people. I know some of them. Um, I guess uh, we never did. And, uh, and also, uh, I don't know the reason. I mean, it could theoretically have an effect on renal function, uh, but it's gotta be really rare. And most people now are using oxcarbazepine over carbamazepine. Um, I guess there's some insurance plans that would not want to cover that as first line, but um, that I haven't gotten any pushback on. It doesn't mean it doesn't occur, <coughs> but I haven't gotten pushback. Okay. I think this might be a follow-up to it. It says, N says need to check intracular pressure. Are these important? For NSAIDs? I, I well, think NSAIDs it's are non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. And uh, I'm not familiar with the degree of risk for increased intraocular pressure. That's looking for glaucoma. I'm not aware of that being a problem with any of the anti-seizure medications. Okay, she followed up. I'm sorry. Um, it says Tegretol, check intraocular pressure. Ocular pressure? I have never done that. And okay. I've never heard of anybody doing that. Um, I, I could sort of imagine a convoluted scenario, but it, it's not something that would be on the top of my list to, to worry about. <laughs> he said, thanks. I won't either from now on. Okay. I saw I see <laughs> That's good, Carrie. All oh, right. Sorry. sorry. So I think that's it for questions. If anybody right. has one. But, but just share with people if they have questions, if there are cases, they can submit them for consultation. Uh, they can send me messages. Uh, the best way is through, the, through the e my direct email because I don't get to the uh, Maven website often enough. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's fair. But I'm going to plug the Maven uh, online prep platform for any of our your neurology needs. <laughs> but all right. So thank you so much, Dr. Salt. You're very uh, welcome. And thank you, everybody, for staying on till the end. We appreciate Talk it. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye.